All right, I've noticed that a lot of Bayesian network tutorials do not fully walk through an example problem. So this is a full example problem uh, for a Bayesian network. What are the relevant equations? First one is Bayes rule. Probability that events happen given some conditions is equal to the probability of that event and condition divided by the probability of the condition. So some examples, we have uh, one event, one condition. We can also have multiple events and multiple conditions. We'll store this equation down at the bottom for reference. Second equation, the probability of some subset of events A is equal to the sum over B of the probability of some subset of events A and subset of events B. So an example, the probability of A and B is equal to the sum over C of the probability of A, B, and C. And we can have multiple sums. So we'll also store this at the bottom. Okay, third equation. The probability of x1 and x2 and x3 all the way to xn is equal to the probability of x1 given its parents times the probability of x2 given its parents product all the way through to probability of xn given its parents. Let's say we have this Bayesian network here. The probability of A, B, C, and D is equal to the probability of A given its parents, which it has none, times the probability of B given its parents, times the probability of C given its parents, times the probability of D given its parents. We'll also store this at the bottom for later. All right, a brief aside. Let's look at the numerical difference between the probability of A and B and the probability of A given B. So let's say we have two probability distributions. You can see that the top probability distribution sums to one. But the bottom distribution sums to one for each case of B. So the top distribution is the probability of A and B because across A and B, the probability distribution sums to one. And the bottom distribution is the probability of A given B, because for each case of B, there is a probability distribution of A. Let's get into the example problem. Let's say we are given this network. You've probably seen it before. It's an example network of an alarm system in your house where a burglary or an earthquake could trigger your alarm and that alarm going off could cause your neighbor John or your neighbor Mary to call you. We'll store this at the top corner for the rest of the video and we will refer to each variable by its first letter rather than its full name. So we're given the probability of a burglary, probability of B, and the probability of E. We're working with Boolean values here, so to get the probability that a variable is false, all we have to do is subtract the probability that a variable is true from one. But that wouldn't be the case if we were working with a variable that can take on three values. Okay, we're also given the probability of A given B and E, the probability of J given A, and the probability of M given A. So let's say we want to find the probability of B given that J is true and M is true. So a solution. How are we going to store our variables? This is dependent on how you're going to program it, but this is just how we programmed it. The probability of A given B and E. This is the most complicated probability distribution, so we'll look at how this one's stored. Now you can store it as a one-dimensional array, and you can infer um, the values that A, B, and E take on. But uh, we decided that it would be best to store it as an n-dimensional matrix, where n is the number of variables involved in the probability distribution. So in this case, there's three variables, and there'll be a dimension for each variable. So the first dimension will be A, second dimension B, and third dimension E. And we just fill in our values. All right, next step. We have this probability distribution that we want to find, the probability of B given J and M. And we got to get it in terms of things that we know. So if you look down at our reference equation, we'll use Bayes' rule to get rid of this given. So instead of the probability of B given J and M, we'll get it in terms of probability of B and J and M. And then it's typical to see that one over the probability of your evidence, in this case J and M, 
is denoted alpha. So we'll do that here. And then looking down our reference equations again, we'll use our second reference equation to take this probability of B, J, and M and make it the full probability distribution of the entire network. And we'll sum out the variables that we don't want, E and A. And now we'll use our third reference equation and we will break up this probability of B, J, M, A, and E into its individual probability distributions. So this equation is in terms of things that we know, but we can do a little more rearranging to simplify the process. So we will move to a new page and put that equation back up at the top. Now you'll notice that some things we can move outside the sum. So for example, the probability of B is not dependent on E or A. So we can move that completely outside of both sums. The probability of J given A and the probability of M given A are not dependent on E, so we can move it outside of the sum of E. And we end up with this. We no longer need our reference equations, so we'll store this equation down at the bottom. Now all we have left to do is plug in the numbers. So let's take a look at our first operation. The probability of E times the probability of A given B and E. So let's pull up the probability distributions. Now this isn't matrix multiplication, this is going to be element by element multiplication. But as you can see, the dimensions don't match. So that's a problem for us. There are three variables in this, A, B, and E. So, you know, the way we're storing this is there's a dimension for each variable. So both matrices have to have a dimension for A, a dimension for B, and a dimension for E. Now, the probability of A given B and E already does that, but the probability of E does not. So what we're going to have to do is expand the probability of E so that it has dimensions for A and B. So it's pretty simple. All we do is repeat it over dimensions A and B. And now I've put the, the dimension E as our final dimension because we're going to eventually be summing it and we'll get rid of that dimension. Okay, carry out with the element by element multiplication and you end up with this. Now, if you look down our reference equation, all we did was multiply, so now we have to sum. So we'll break it apart and we'll sum it. And then we end up with this. If you look, each row sums to one. So for each case of B, there's a probability distribution of A. So this is the probability of A given B. Just to shorten our reference equation at the bottom, we will plug this in instead of the sum of E of probability of E times the probability of A given B and E. Okay, the next step. We'll look at the probability of J given A times the probability of M given A. The dimensions match right now, but we're working with three variables. So each probability distribution has to have three dimensions. One for J, one for M, and one for A. The probability of J given A does not have a dimension for M, and the probability of M given A does not have a dimension for J. So we will pre-allocate two new probability distributions with the first dimension being J, the second dimension being M, and the third dimension being A. Again, we're going to leave A as our last dimension because we're going to be summing over A. So, we take the probability of J given A and we repeat it along the dimension of M. And then we do a similar thing. We take the probability of M given A, but now we repeat it over the dimension of J. And now we can carry out with the element by element multiplication. And we end up with this. Now we still have to multiply this times the probability of A given B. But we'll break it apart and we'll take a look at what this probability distribution is. You can see that for each case of A, there's a probability distribution across J and M. So this is the probability of J and M given A. We'll plug this into our reference equation again, just to shorten it. And then the next step, we got to take that matrix that we just found, the probability of J and M given A, and we got to multiply it times the probability of A given B. So here it is. Again, we got to do some more uh, pre-allocating. We're dealing with four variables now, J, M, A, and B. Now we're going to want to put A as our final dimension again, because we're going to be summing and getting rid of it. So we will pre-allocate two new 
probability distributions, where J is the first dimension, M is the second dimension, B is the third dimension, and A is the fourth dimension. Now, it doesn't really matter what order they're in, as long as the final dimension is the dimension that you're going to be summing over. Now we'll take the probability of J and M given A, and we will repeat it over the dimension B. And then we will take the probability of A given B, and we will repeat it over the dimensions of J and M. And now we carry through with the multiplication, and we end up with this. Now we got to break it apart, and we got to sum it, and we end up with this. So what is this matrix? Well, if we take a look at it, for each case of B, there is a probability distribution of J and M. So this is the probability of J and M given B. And now we'll plug that in the bottom to shorten the equation. And we'll move on to our final steps. The probability of B times the probability of J and M given B. We're working with three variables, J, M, and B, and the probability of J and M given B already accounts for those three dimensions. So we just have to expand the probability of B, and we have to expand it along the J and M dimensions. And then we carry through with the element by element multiplication, and we end up with this. Now there's no summing, but we will break it apart and take a look at it. You can see that the entire probability distribution sums to one. So this is the probability of B and J and M. Again, we'll plug this in the bottom, we see that our final desired probability distribution, the probability of B given J and M, does not match the order of dimensions that we have here. We have J, then M, then B. So we'll rearrange this just so that B is the first dimension, J is the second, and M is the third. Now we have to multiply by alpha. Now rather than solve for it explicitly, what we can do is take a look at this probability distribution and compare it to our desired probability distribution, the probability of B given J and M. Now we know that the probability of B given J and M will have a full probability distribution of B for each case of J and M. So we'll take a look at this matrix we have right here, and you'll see that for each case of J and M, it does not sum to one, but we can just divide by the sum, and now it will sum to 1. So now you can see that for each case of J and M, there's a full probability distribution of B. So this is the probability of B given J and M. Now we're not quite done. We were given evidence. So let's take a look at how we use that evidence. We were given evidence that J is true and M is true. So all we have to do is look that up on the table. We gotta find where J is true and where M is true. And we'll pull out the probability distribution of B. And that's our final answer. There's a 28% chance that B is true and a 72% chance that B is false.